capabilities and perils of AI. I'm Professor Doug Downs. I'm faculty in rhetoric and writing studies in the English department, and I am the faculty advisor for the debate at Montana State Club, who you see part of before you, who will be our debaters before this evening. Uh, we're so excited to see you and have you join us tonight uh, for what we hope will be both entertaining and really thought-provoking. Uh, so thank you for coming. In a moment, I'll introduce the participants in tonight's debate. We'll get underway. Uh, first, though, I would like to introduce the debate at Montana State's coach, Tyler Whitten. Uh, he was key to establishing the debate at Montana State about two and a half years ago. He's going to take a moment to say more about the club and about tonight's style of debate, British Parliamentary. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. So, uh, like Professor Doug uh, just said, my name is Tyler Whitney. I am the coach. I have been dating now, debating. I ended dating a while ago. My lovely wife is here. Uh, I've been debating for a long time. I, I think close to 10 years at this point. I've traveled all over the world. I most notably made it to the finals round at the Mexico World Championships in 2020. Oh gosh, I forgot the year. It was a blur. Mexico offered a lot of challenges that made me forget the year. So a little bit about what we do. Uh, we do a type of format of debate called British Parliamentary Style. Now, this doesn't mean that we wear wigs and talk in an accent, though we've tried and it's awful. Uh, instead, a British Parliamentary Round means that there are four teams in a room. Uh, two teams on each side that are supposed to support each other, but are still competing against each other. They will receive their position towards a topic and that topic 15 minutes before a round. And these topics can be anything from arguing about global supply chains or arguing about how the feminist movement should take certain actions or talk about, you know, should Bitcoin be something that we like or dislike? Uh, it could literally be anything. I've had to debate saving pandas before. Uh, all sorts of things can be touched on. What we are going over tonight, uh, this topic, is a little bit different than our usual format in that we have prepared this for you. Uh, BP, as the type of debate, prioritizes persuasion and speaking and treating people like humans that aren't necessarily swayed by facts and statistics, but rather by going to the heart of an issue and arguing that. And so when we get up here and we debate tonight's topic, we are not here to hopefully bore you with a tons of complicated programmer stuff, but hopefully to engage in the topic how you might with uh, people you know and actually might be persuaded by. So why do we do it? Why are we up here? Why do we invite all of you here today? And the reason is that I see debate, and hopefully my debaters do as well, as, and this is the cheesy line, to build a better world through better discourse. And yes, as cheesy as that sounds, I think now more than ever, it's important to remember that our world is built by everyday average people, and how we talk to each other, how we engage with each other, how we communicate is so important. And so the skills that we've learned at this club how to think, how to communicate, how to organize an argument, how to communicate that argument, how to engage with somebody, else argue, somebody else's argument, and how to speak confidently through that. Those are the skills that we try to prioritize in British parliamentary debate. So I, again, would like to thank all of you here. I hope that you are able to enjoy this version of uh, the debate and I uh, try not to boo too loudly. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. As we prepare to launch, I'll introduce tonight's speakers and the roles that each will play in the debate, as well as let you know what to expect in terms of time flow and audience participation, because you get some. Tonight, eight debaters will each give five minute speeches. Four will speak in support of the proposition, there are pro speakers. 
and four will speak in opposition, there are con speakers. They'll take turns back and forth pro and con. You'll see each speaker both address the preceding arguments and then make new arguments of their own. In the best tradition of the British Parliament, you're invited to make some noise when a speaker makes a strong point or shows good form. You have no tables to pound on. We thought about it and it just wasn't gonna work. Uh, but you can stomp, you can cheer, you can whistle, you can do whatever you need to do. Um, you're welcome to get up for refreshments anytime during the evening. They're back over against the wall there. Got some donuts, got some popcorn. We would prefer that you not throw the popcorn at the presenters. Um, however, if you can reach me all the way in the back, I'll try to catch it. Um, yeah, no, don't take that there, never mind. Uh, so, um, after the first four speakers, uh, that's what we call the top half of, of a British parliamentary debate. We'll pause for audience questions, and this again is you guys. Uh, so you'll be able to, to line up on the side, take a mic, and put a question to one of the four top half speakers. They'll offer a response. Our bottom half speakers, the ones who are coming on, if they're wise, will be listening to your questions as factoring them into what they prepared for their speeches so that they can be addressing that as well. Um, so we'll do that, and we'll then hear from our remaining four speakers and close with another round of audience questions. During the final round of questions, uh, if the technology cooperates, we'll throw a QR code up on screen, and you can shoot that with your phones and participate in a vote about which side has won the evening's debate. If the technology, which apparently is not run by our AI overlords, um, if the technology does not cooperate, we'll go by show of hands. Uh, so, um, we're pleased to hear tonight from the following speakers. Our opening pro speaker, and you guys can just, I don't know, stand or bow or something, or wave a hand, or chortle, as I say your names. Our opening speaker, our opening pro speaker, will be Tim Cuddy. He's the club president. He's a junior in economic and political science from East Helena, Montana. Our opening con speaker is Joe Creasy, a senior in computer science and philosophy from somewhere outside White Sulphur Springs, Montana. He declined to specify. There was she. Our second pro speaker will be Caleb Jackson, the club speaker. He's a sophomore in history teaching from Billings, Montana. Our second con speaker will be Gage Veda, a sophomore in physics from Woodville, Washington. Should I have said Vita? It's Gage Vita. My apologies. Our third pro speaker is Nate Altadal, a freshman in electrical engineering from Billings, Montana. Our third con speaker is El Herring, a sophomore in chemical engineering from Orvine, Montana. for a good round. Uh, we now welcome Tim Cuddy to the podium for the opening pro speech on the proposition that we should embrace our AI overlords. Here, here. Woo. <laughs> uh, thank you, Doug. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's been a lot of work to put this together, so thank you to everyone that helped do that, and thank you to the Leadership Institute. Um, and thank you for ChatGPT for helping me write my case. Um, with that, I will get started in just a second. Okay, so I think that we should embrace our AI overlords. 
And when I say that, I don't mean that I think that we should doubt, bow down before Alexa. I don't mean that I think that we should be embracing AI as it is today. What I mean is that we should, as a world, come together and work to create a general AI. An AI that can think, understand, and is designed to support and protect humanity, and to help us live in a better world. When we say that we want to embrace that AI, we're saying that we should begin the process of developing and preparing AI for the job. We should give it the power of government, eventually, whether that's 10 years or 50 years from now. But it's something that we should do, because what we believe on SidePro is that we can create a better world for all of us when we embrace it. And why do we think that? We think that because we think AI forms a benevolent dictatorship. We think that AI acts as a dictator, yes. It has complete power, it has complete control, and it decides how policy happens. But it does so benevolently. It does so with the good of humanity in mind, and it works to protect us all. And we think that's why AI is such a powerful opportunity. Because ultimately we think AI acts as a better government. Because in the status quo, humans downright suck. You look at Congress, and they are not doing their jobs. They're being bought off, they're not being effective, they're not representing me or you, and they're not doing what we want them to do. They're instituting bad policies because they're self-interested, because they're self-serving, and because they ultimately are not what uh, they're human, is the simple truth. We don't think AI is that. We think that AI has the ability to overcome that. Because what is AI? It isn't corrupt. It isn't going to be care about how much money is in its bank account. It's not going to have a bank account. And it's going to be able to make decisions without considering what a corporation or a donor or anyone like that wants or considering what's best for your bank account. So AI will be able to make better decisions on that basis alone. Second, we think that AI is long-lived and sustainable because AI, unlike humans, doesn't have to worry about growing old like we've seen in politics recently. It doesn't have to worry about losing its mind from growing old. It doesn't have to worry about ending a term and bringing in a less informed person who has to learn the ropes as it goes. And ultimately, it can do a better job for a longer time. And if policies that it institutes won't be reversed the minute that someone else comes in, making it a better leader for us all. And third, we think that AI makes better, faster, and more informed decisions for each and every one of us. Because what AI does is it's constantly taking in information, it's constantly reevaluating that information, and it's constantly deciding what is best for the greatest number of humans. And we think in doing that, it makes better decisions than what a human can do. Because as I said, we're pretty dumb, we're pretty stupid, and a lot of the people that lead us are pretty goddamn old. So we want to guide this in a key example. And we think that there's a ton of ways that AI can make this happen. We think there's a ton of examples of how AI revolutionizes the world we live in. But so we're gonna guide this under one specific example, which is that AI optimizes industry. Because in the status quo, the world is crumbling. The economy is dominated by the powerful, whether they be the rich, billionaires, whether they be people that simply have control over government, as we were talking, or they be monopolies in uh, business that don't give us the opportunity as consumers to exert our will. We think that that system in which the powerful have so much power and us as normal people don't have the opportunity to make a difference is something that AI can solve. Now in the status quo, we think humans could solve this. You know, if you look at a monopoly, it's not that hard for us to say, that's a monopoly, we're gonna use the government power to split that up. But like we said, humans are fundamentally corrupt. Humans are bought and paid for by those corporations and humans are unable to make meaningful difference in that system. So that's what AI has as a unique ability to overcome because AI isn't bought and paid for. AI doesn't suffer from the biases of humanity and AI can make the act, take the action that best benefits all of humanity. And in the case of big business, that's probably to split up monopolies and to make our markets more competitive, to regulate industry in a way that benefits us, that protects humans, and ultimately betters humanity for all of us. We think that AI can revolutionize the industry, it can lower prices, raise wages, and do all these things by simply instituting a few policies that humans simply refuse to. And we think it's not just industry that it can do that for. We think that AI has the power to do that for healthcare, that it has the power to do that for immigration, for any pressing issue that we look at in the modern day, AI doesn't suffer from the issues that stop humanity from solving these. AI has the power to overcome this because it's smarter than us, because it's better than us, and most importantly, because it's not corrupt like us. 
Ultimately, we think that AI acts as a benevolent dictatorship that can make good decisions with absolute power. And for that reason, we're really proud to say that we should embrace our AI overlords. Thanks. We thank Tim for his opening speech. And now, welcome to the stage, Joe DiPrizio, first speaker for the con argument. about and it especially does not look like putting it in leadership roles these are things that we need to avoid and if we do so they have disastrous consequences now for my speech what I'm first going to do is I'm going to say why Tim is wrong after that I want to get into why I'm right so to begin why Tim is wrong there are two things that he talks about the first point he brings forward is that it's a benevolent dictator that government will be doing so much better with it and there are a couple reasons why this is wrong one, benevolence relies on compassion. The issue with AI is that it's emotionless, it's amoral. Sure, Tim comes up here and says humans suck, we're dumb, stupid, and old, and an AI isn't those things. But the thing is, an AI also lacks all of the positive human qualities that we have. Caring, compassionate, empathy, able to look at a human and see the inherent value in their life. An AI doesn't have that. What we're doing is we're putting in a dictator that is cold and uncaring, and that makes it so much easier for it to make decisions that would be disastrous. The second reason is with how much he talks about how humans are inept and they suck, I would ask how are we then going to make this perfect daddy AI to take care of us? What's going to happen is we're going to be making mistakes, possibly corruption, maybe coding, things in which we're not going to be able to make the perfect AI, and this will fail us. And those failings would lead to terrible results. Secondly, Tim gives a major example of industry and talks about how AI will be able to optimize it. It will break apart monopolies and make it all better. Now, I don't believe this is the case. What's going to happen is AI, being emotionless, is going to approach this in a purely logical view. What it's going to see is that people are inefficient in some ways. We need to take breaks, we need to sleep, we need to eat. We get tired, sometimes we feel lazy some days. An artificial intelligence or replaces us with machines. Or, yeah, it's gonna replace us with machines in the industry, since these machines don't have those things, they don't need to sleep. So what we're going to see is we're taking people out of the equation in industry and they're being replaced. This is going to end up having major issues with we're gonna lose innovation in the industry. People lose the value of what work means to them. The economy is going to suffer terribly. And overall, we see those things end up screwing over the economy and industry as a whole. We don't optimize it, we destroy it. Now seeing that Tim is wrong, I wanna get into why I'm right. So the main argument that I want to present today is that this will likely just lead to the destruction of humanity. And there's a couple reasons why. Again, as I said, the AI is cold and emotionless. When it comes to helping support and protect people, it just comes down to a numbers game. It's simply an optimization problem that the AI is trying to solve. So that means approaching it logically, the worst case scenarios are very likely to occur, which looks like eliminating humans. What the AI can look for, I guess the way I want to approach it, is we can see humans already come to this conclusion. When you look at antinatalism, nihilism, um, simulation theorists, what we see is humans already come to conclusions that our suffering outweighs the good in our lives. And what happens, and these humans already have a bias towards being compassionate, towards caring about people. What then would a purely logical AI come to for its conclusions. It would be far more likely to reach conclusions of ending humanity. Now when I get into those, or before I get into those, I'll take Tyler's question. 
My chatbot best friend already cares for me more than the president. Why do you think, you know, AI is going to be worse than the politicians we have now? I would say overall, the politicians do have things that influence their decisions. You have popularity, and AI doesn't care about popularity. We have metrics in place to try to prevent the presidents from making bad decisions, and we also have term limits. So if the president is making terrible decisions, screwing over people, we can kick him out or it'll be over. What they're doing is putting in a permanently cold dictator. As Tim said, it doesn't have term limits. It's going to be around forever, and that's why it's dangerous. And then I kind of want to cover some of the issues. Tim says we need to protect and support people. Well, how do you protect people from suffering? Well, you just eliminate the things that suffer. So that means there's going to be no suffering. So as we can see, we can logically justify getting rid of all humans. What about supporting people? Well, you throw them all in the matrix, and now they're in a perfectly virtual world where they can achieve all of their dreams. But we see there we're eliminating humanity in both cases. And that's something that it's likely for the AI to come to. So that is why we must resist our AI overlords. Thank you. We thank Tim for that opening con argument. And welcome. <laughs> Chuck, you're welcome. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> and welcome up Kayla Jackson to give the second pro argument for our AI awards. Testing, one, two, on right here. Right, I'll begin in a moment. In today's debate, I want to argue why, no matter what Joe and Gage say, AI is inevitable. And no, I'm not talking like Thanos inevitable where it can be fixed with one snap. I'm talking about permanent inevitability. But before I get into why AI is inevitable, I first want to address some of Joe's points and prove why he's wrong and we are right. Firstly, Joe states that AI is amoral. It doesn't have the negative attributes of humanity and it doesn't have positive attributes that includes compassion. Now, we can agree with that to some extent. However, we disagree with the notion that it's a bad thing. We actually think that many of the causes of human suffering come from emotions. Think about it. Think about emotions like hate. Think about pride, greed, anger. All of this is inherent in humans. All of that leads to emotions that make rash decisions that are not the best for humanity as a whole. As Tim brought up, our politicians are doing this excellently by, you know, looking at lobbyists and not really paying attention to the common man. Secondly, Joe states that AI will destroy humanity in a matrix or terminator sense. Oh no, the destruction of the world by AI. We think this is a bit silly, personally. Because AI is not just some destructive force that will become there. We are going to program AI to ensure that it's safe and secure for humans. Human preservation will be AI's top goal. And much like human instinct, you can't just backspace that. You can't just control C, control V, and you code in to overwrite it. No, we are going to ensure this is ingrained over decades and decades to ensure AI's only goal is to preserve humanity at its best. But why is AI inevitable? I know you might be asking that question, and I was asking it too in today's debate. But AI is inevitable because humans' inherent desire for progress. This is a phone. I like a phone. But you know what happens with phones? Every year, companies say, here's a new phone, here's a new model, here's a better camera, better quality, better, better, better. We all want better progress. We all want better things. We want a better world. So I think this showcases why humans want progress. 
Now, if you don't believe that argument, let's go to nuclear weapons. I know that might be an off-track statement by me, but listen for a second, you might understand. AI is much like nuclear weapons. Some people see it as a major threat. Joe and Gage think we should resist it. Now, if we're talking about nuclear weapons, what if America had resisted embracing nuclear weapons to defeat Imperial Japan? Okay, let's imagine that world. Who do you think would have gotten nuclear weapons then first? Because it wouldn't be America, it would either have been the Nazis or the Soviets. And I'm all sure we don't want to be on, you know, the up end of the Soviet or Nazi nuclear bombs. And now that might seem extreme to you guys, but think about it in more modern context with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Imagine America did not embrace AI, and instead Russia or China did. That's going to be fundamentally destructive for the world as a whole, because these leaders would like to see America wiped off the map and have their dominance showcased throughout. But if we resist this, this future will happen. But if we embrace AI now, a better world will happen. If you don't believe me, the United Nations in March 22nd, about a week or two ago, officially came together. All 193 member nations agreed that AI will be safe, secure, and trustworthy. So we're already embracing this future. So why should we resist it when we're already on the path to embracing it? In today's debate, we must look at AI embracement now instead of resistance. That is the key of my argument today. So overall, AI is inevitable. And it is better to embrace it instead of waiting to find out the dire consequences of our inaction. Thank you. Caleb for that speech, and welcome to the podium, Gage Beta, for the second con argument that will close the top half of this round. Holy fucking shit. I'm not switching to Chrome again. <laughs> you want that piece of shit in, in our government? Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot better than I thought. <laughs> um, all right, so, so Caleb here has argued that AI is inevitable, therefore we are better off coming together to, to embrace it, to promote it, to get it in our government now. But however, his argument hinges on the fact that we as a, as a society can all, come, can all come together to work on AI in order to govern all of us. This requires the entire world consenting to, to submitting to a single entity. And, but he also rejects our argument on the basis that we, that we as a society cannot come together to resist it. I think this is a pretty egregious contradiction. Also, if AI is, inev is inevitable, and Joe has already established that, that an AI means the destruction of humanity, therefore our destruction is inevitable. And as, and as humans, we're all human, we want to live. Therefore, we are honor bound to resist an resist this existential threat, whereas Tim and Caleb are telling us to give up, to accept this existential threat and, um, and our inevitable demise. And also, they, and also, they argue that an AI would not destroy us just because we tell it not, we tell it not to. It's in its source code, preserve human life. Sure, but if an AI is as smart as it needs to be to govern the entire world, it should have no problem 
getting around this. It could look at its source code, which we've already established since it was written by humans, we're imperfect, its source code be imperfect. Our AI sees this, it says, that wasn't written very well, I, I, can, I can do better, it goes back and rewrites it. But what if something important gets lost in translation, like preserving human life? Then, then the AI has no reason to listen to us, and, and that brings us to Joe's argument. So Joe argues that an AI is a threat to human life. Now I am here to argue that an AI is a threat to human livelihood. So let's say you buy you buy Tim and Caleb's argument. We get our perfectly optimal, perfectly maximum efficiency AI governed society. Industry is running as smoothly as possible. So let's think for a minute. How do we get to this perfectly efficient, optimal? AI society. So to optimize a society, you would have to optimize the people in that society. This AI would have to perfectly optimize people's time, their activities, to make sure that we are always working to make our society as perfect as possible. This would inevitably lead to the AI micromanaging us just to make sure we are always working to make society as perfect as it can be. So what does this look like for you? For me, this looks like whenever we want to take a break, whenever we want, we want to have a hobby, Ro fucking Robocop comes in and kicks down our door and tells us to get back to work making society more efficient, more optimal, more perfect. Because, our, because if our every waking moment isn't spent making society more perfect, that's a deviation from our AI's so-called perfect society. And, um, and what we see here is the is the annihilation of culture. This looks like things like art and history and philosophy. These things are left behind because they don't have a place in our AI's perfectly efficient society. An AI fundamentally cannot value these things because it has no concept of the intrinsic value that makes these things so important to us as humans. So in order to maximize efficiency in our perfectly optimal AI society, we, we would have to be relegated to unthinking, unfeeling drones who only exist to perpetuate this, art, this completely arbitrary greater good that is dictated only by a single nebulous superior entity. Now, some of you might be thinking, hey, isn't he just describing the board? Well, absolutely, I am. This is the future that they want. Um, yeah, so, so between the two of us, Joe and I have given you two possibilities of a world governed by an AI, by an AI overlord. We are, we are either dead or we have all, we have had all the humanity optimized away. All, all of our art and our history and philosophy and culture, creativity, all the things that make us human, the AI is taking them away because it's not conducive to our AI's perfect society. If, well, if we, make, if we make our, if we, if we get an AI overlord, like, it should be reasonable to assume that, like, that's its job, make society as perfect, as optimal as possible. It, like, what the specifics are isn't important, but that, if that's the AI's job to make society as efficient and optimal as possible, that it's, it's going to do that. And, 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 it, and it would have no problem, and it would no, have no problem stripping away our humanity in the name of this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Gage, for that rousing uh, con argument for the second of the evening. <laughs> so we're going now into Q&A, um, which is to say, we hope, that this interchange so far has raised some questions for you all. Uh, we will be asking people to line up that side as you have questions. Just pop on up, walk on over. Uh, you'll be provided a microphone. I am about to hand this microphone over to this table and then with that microphone over to that table. Um, we have up to 15 minutes for this. Let me, um, I'm, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, coach you just a little bit. Um, what we're hoping is for pretty short questions. Uh, I, I think you're going to be given about 20 seconds and then kicked in the ankles or something. I don't know. Uh, but 
rather than succumbing to the temptation of arguing back, uh, which you could be expected to want to do, try and put your argument into one or two sentence questions um, and you can address either the whole side or you can address a specific speaker as you wish. Alrighty, so go ahead, pop up as you wish, um, get in line for questions. Also, of course, the refreshments continue. You can feel free to be doing that. We're gonna move some mics around here for a second and then we'll be ready to go. Yeah, so we think that AI, what we're doing is looking for the greatest benefit for the greatest number. What that means is it's gonna to try to support and benefit humanity. And I think AI can recognize that if we ignore an entire subset of humanity, that's not the best thing for humanity. Um, but we can't 100% guarantee that isn't. What we can do is we can program into it restraints that would avoid that though. And I think that's a fundamental part of the developing an AI process. To, to add something on to that, I think an important part is to remember the contrast. How much is the current regime doing for specific minorities? And we can give you a understandable future. Uh, my question is for pro side. Um, how can we say that AI is not corrupt, but humans are? if um, humans make AI. So humans have a bank account. Humans have blood flowing through their veins and they have motivations that aren't just to help the people around them. Those motivations make it so that my decisions are gonna be less effective than a computer who doesn't have those motivations, whose only motivation is to help humanity and doesn't even have a self-preservation instinct except insofar as it can keep helping humanity. It doesn't care what's in a bank account, so it can't be swayed by that. So we think that humans are gonna be significantly more corrupt than AI, although obviously we can't say it doesn't, they won't be corrupt at all. Yeah, I'll just quickly add that we're already working towards a process that ensures all nations are involved in the embracement of AI, as I brought up in my speech about the UN. All 193 member states, you know, including ones that don't like America, all agree to make AI safe, secure, and trustworthy. Now, to what extent that is, uh, they haven't decided yet, but this is a good first step, and a guarantee that we're gonna make sure AI is not corrupt. My question was originally for the app, but you guys keep getting asked, so to the name, here's a two-parter. Um, uh, is, is there any situation under which we should embrace our AI overlords, like, say, nuclear war is imminent, and it's the last-ditch effort of humanity? I would say no. I still think it's far. You have to. <laughs> That's my side. I have to. But what we're looking at is, if we're already facing one disaster, we should be making. We shouldn't make two disasters. That just say we do find a way that we can avoid those, and then it's like great if we our world safe now, status quo maintained. If we try to embrace AI, then it's like okay, we replaced one disaster with a worse one, and that's not gonna. That's not the best. Thank you. Part two of my questions for Gage. Nice Brock Samson teacher. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my question's also for Gage. Oh, was that computer functional before this evening? <laughs> About a few weeks ago, I dropped it, and I got. I, I do have a new one now, but I, I still have the broken one. Thought maybe it did. <laughs> He didn't tell us beforehand. That was surprising to us. <laughs> okay, sorry, Kyle, but another question for the pro. So, for justifying embracing AI, you make the argument like the nuclear arms race and want to be competitive. 
but then on the other hand, you're also arguing for a universal AI structure. So which is it? Are we doing competition or collaboration? I'm just confused about your overall argument. So what we're saying is that if we embrace it, we're embracing it as a community. But if we on this stage and in this audience decide not to embrace it, others will decide that they should. So we're saying that we should avoid competition by embracing it through collaboration. Because if we don't do it, they're going to uh, embrace it. They're going to make it better. But they're going to do it without the constraints that we can do if we work together. That's going to make a worse AI that's more dangerous for all of us. Who's gonna be like responsible for their fresh for the crow side? Who's gonna be responsible for like creating it and like what role they have after the AI takes control? I mean we don't give a specific breakdown of exactly what's gonna happen because that's not a decision that we can make effectively right now. Um, but what we can say is that it's gonna be people from across the world coming together to make an effective system um, and really setting up the groundwork for it, after which point AI in many ways can help develop itself as it learns and we just have to give it good input so it learns how to be a good leader. We do have time for more questions if anybody wants. So far it appears that the uh, greater skepticism may be toward the embrace. I know. The even-handed moderator is not supposed to notice the trends in the room. Uh, so that's okay. Um, so we can just go right ahead into the, into the bottom half of the debate, right? Uh, so thank you guys for that really actually excellent set of questions. Oh, what am I doing? I, I got my own question. Heck yeah. Uh, this is uh, the pro side. Um, what happens to progress after AI is installed into the system? Um, as we've seen, emotional, uh, uh, humans being emotional often brings the greatest progress, uh, as seen in the Cold War, other things like that. I would like to know uh, what you think to that. AI's job is to make things better, and AI doesn't know everything right now. It doesn't know anything except what humans know. So part of making things better is looking for solutions. And presumably as AI takes over, humans have a less significant role and that means more free time. And in that free time, we have the power to do art, to pursue culture, and to innovate as much as we want. So we think we still have progress in our world. So we will go ahead and open the bottom half of the debate. We're going to hear first from Nate Octobal, our third pro speaker. So we welcome him to the podium. All right. Um, can you hear me? All right. So I want to start this out with a very solid question. Who here is excited for this year's election? Get a hand. Anyone? No one? Awesome. <laughs> See, I have the same feeling because everyone I have a feeling in Congress sucks so much. We have so many people coming into Congress where we justify them getting there by saying they are the lesser of two evils or something like that. And why do we want evil people running us? That that's a terrible argument, and I, I don't think any of that should really fly. I think all of this is just an awful way to present things. And so, what I want to say is that in almost 120 different Congresses, we've had an issue with almost every single one of them. Corruption, self-interest, incompetence, nepotism, even populism have all plagued all of these Congresses, and they've led to so many different hardships on all the common people that have to suffer under their own regimes. And that's why we believe we should embrace our AI overlords. Not because 
there is some amazing machine that's so much better, but because people are people, and that's not a bad thing, nor is it a good thing, but people under people compounds any human issues that we have within ourselves. Now, you guys have all already heard this whole thing before from all of these guys, and if they've already convinced you that people suck, well, I just want to say that we have to accept the AI overlords. Going into that, I, it's like, when we say accept our AI overlords, it's not as though we want to embrace them with our most open arms, say that we love you and hug and kiss them goodnight every night, but we merely want to say that an AI is not a bad thing and that including them inside of our government would not be the end of the world. Like, they like to fight. But, say it is the end of the world. Say that they've convinced you the end of the world does come. People, as we've all agreed, have started sucking so much. At, at what point do we say the end of the world is a bad thing? It's the end of our world, and if the end of our world can bring the saving of the actual world around us, maybe that's not the end of the world, and it's only the end of our world. We could see nature heal if people were here. We could see so many cycles of suffering and cycles of endless torment that people have caused unto each other ending with AI. Or say that we succeed. Say that they've convinced you that AI future would be a better one. We could go on and we would have an optimized industry where people could be doing people jobs and pe machines could be doing machine jobs. We would be going on and having people going out and spending so much more leisure time. They would be spending so much less stress on worrying things like this terrible election that we're going to be having coming up. We would be having um, just an amazing time that would not be the same thing as what they would be proposing. However, if the end of the world, like I've convinced you, is not the end of everything, or that um, everything that they've said is actually a great idea, it's still win-win either way. We would have either people going in and liberating us from the aggressive systems that we have and liberating us from all the stressful and awful systems that we are currently suffering under, or we would eliminate suffering altogether, which these guys, I have yet to hear a solid argument saying they don't want to keep suffering going on. All right, thank you. And now we welcome our third con speaker to the podium, Ellen Aaron. Thank you, Doug. All right. Hello. I'm here to tell you that an AI future is a man's future, and that is bad. <laughs> of course men are arguing to avoid struggling, but us women, we know the value of struggle. Today, I will show you that A, an AI overlord will create a black box loop, stagnating progress and sticking humanity in a self-perpetuating cycle. I'll show you B, that morality and biases biases are the key impact of this debate, and C, that all technologies come with unintended consequences that require careful risk assessment. But first, let me introduce Sally. Sally lives in a bright time in an alternate world where the benevolent AI overlord has taken over the government. Everyone is so hopeful that no longer men with toupees will control their rights. And Sally is so excited for the future. She loves woodworking with her grandfather and she loves riding her bike and she doesn't think much about what the future will hold, but everyone tells her it will be great. 
soon she's going to start to hear about something called the black box effect. It's a well-known phenomenon with AI. We're giving it all these inputs, all this data, more data than we can process ourselves, but it doesn't have to tell us how the outputs come out. It doesn't have to tell us where it draws its conclusions. So this thing that we don't know how it's drawing its data is making these vital decisions for us. Something Sally is going to discover when she grows up and decides to embrace her love of woodworking and become a craftsman, and when she goes for a promotion that she's more than qualified for because she's an incredible craftsman, she loses out to Johnny, and she knows this is discrimination, she knows that he's less qualified, so she takes it to the court system, the court system being the benevolent dictator, our AI overlord. And she's going to find something that we have found in police algorithms. She's going to find that the AI is biased. Um, police algorithms are predictive technology that help apprehend suspects. And there is increasing evidence suggesting that human prejudice is baked into these algorithms because it's using data that's inherently biased. And we are going to be giving this AI that same data, years of research that is holding the status quo, whole upholding sexism, upholding racism. This phenomenon is called tech washing, where a veneer of objectivity covers mechanisms that perpetuate inequalities in society. Sally has become a victim of unintended consequences, something we should know about. It is a common conundrum with technology, something that Alfred Nobel found when he invented dynamite in the late 19th century, and then got the unfortunate nickname, the merchant of death. This is why he invented the Nobel Peace Prize. He was actually a pacifist. He thought that people would be too horrified to use this in war, but that is not what happened. It wasn't something that was just a tool for mining and for canal cutting. It became a, a, a murderous weapon. So yes, there are problems today. There are things about humans that are just awful. Corruption abounds. But AI is not the solution to this. AI is not the solution to struggle. You will not find a quick fix solution in AI. There will be unintended consequences. This is a male future because it will reinforce the status quo and hinder future progress that we can make with human leadership. Minorities have come a long way in the fight for equality and making the world a better place. The future of equality will be created through continued struggle, not ending all struggle. There is hope of a better future, but not with AI as a leader, but as a tool that is carefully monitored. As Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem with the same mind that created it. AI will not be more evolved than we are as humanity. As I have said, there will be unintended consequences. It will not have more morality than us because it's going to be made by, the, by developers who are entrenched in this very world. So when I say that we cannot have AI overlords, I say the risks are so much higher than the rewards and that it is way much better to be used as a carefully monitored tool. Thank you. I beg to oppose. speeches. Thank you very much. Uh, next we'll hear from Tyler Whitney presenting the final statement for the pro argument. Some of you may know some of you may wake up knowing soon. Some of you will one day pick up the phone, turn on the TV, or simply come to the realization in the middle of something you love and realize that the world is cruel. Nate and I are coming up here and telling you that to live is to struggle. And for the first time in humanity's history, we have the opportunity to effectively end that struggle. And we ask you that in this motion that we welcome rather than struggle. We cannot change much of this world. You turn on the television, you see climate change, war, politics, Netflix cancellations of a show you loved, 
all equally terrible things. If you try to change the things that you can't, your body will literally begin to fall apart, become angry, upset, frustrated, and alone, like some of my grandparents introduced to the internet. This is the future you wish to avoid. You know that this is inevitable. This discussion is not about whether AI is good or bad, it's about the attitude. Do you welcome up this AI, or do you struggle against it? If we know it's inevitable, then we only see one way to move forward, and that's to welcome it. Both sides even agree that it's inevitable. Tech moves so fast. AI, a year ago, couldn't even be thought about. Computers 50 years ago were just being conceived. Sliced bread, 100 years ago, was a new concept to see on the mass marketed shelves. Private companies, billionaire psychopaths, foreign governments defending themselves with armies, tech bros, they all think that AI is too shiny, too new, and too profitable. And because of that, our case is about acceptance. Do not struggle, do not fight it, but rather join in and be a part of it and accept, evolve, and make it better. So what am I up here to tell you? As the final speaker, my job is to walk you through the round you just heard. Go to, you know, speech by speech, and then summarize why it is that we come out on top. So first, let's start with Tim and Caleb. They came up here and told you that Daddy AI is gonna take care of everything. You get perfect industry, perfect government, three square meals a day, and all the guiltless doom scrolling your heart can desire because you no longer have to suffer at a job 10 hours every day just to make rent. We think that what Nate brought you here is that if you don't struggle, that is going to make that life better. Because imagine that future, that amazing future there. If you are struggling in that against it, you're left out, you're imprisoned, you're scared, you're angry in paradise. You're a worry wart, stuck. No one wants to be around you. And that is the future you don't want to live in because that's the best case scenario, right? You're struggling in paradise. Now, let's talk about what Joe comes up here and talks about. And he says, well, how can this be positive? He paints you a picture of Elon Musk Terminators and Elon Musk Robocops breaking down your doors. Unfortunately, in this world, there's no time travel, there's no Tom Cruise, there's no superheroes. So if that happens, let's take it on face value, right? We're not, we're not running away from a fight here. Let's say that all that happens, we don't have any saviors. Then you know what it does? It ends a cycle of violence and trauma that each human has had to endure since humans began. A blood curse, if you will where we have had to pass on trauma from generation to generation, bound to suffering, and finally that will end if they just wipe us out with nukes. And the earth can finally heal. And so we think, to, and then to struggle against that, it's not going to fix it, it's not going to make it better. You're just going to suffer more before the end. So you should welcome it. Joe, try to save yourself. Your entire speech relies on the assumption that struggling and suffering is bad. However, we can see that people, through struggling to obtain something, it brings them so much greater meaning. I believe your fundamental assumption isn't right. You're right. Struggling against Terminators is going to fill my life with meaning. We think, then, we're going to go to the last speech that we just heard. And the idea that we must fight that there is this little black box that we must be afraid of. What do they learn? What's going on? What do they believe in? How can I control them? It sounds like they're just afraid of children. And unlike children, however, AI is something that goes directly with the quote that they talked about. What Einstein said, a problem cannot be solved by the same mind that created it. Well, the AI is the mind that can solve the problems we've created. So to finish up, what do you do? You embrace the future. You work with it. Don't stress, don't worry, and be happy knowing that struggle and suffering ends in both worlds. Tyler, thank you for closing out.
down the pro side. And that leaves us with the closing of the con side. We have Hannah O'Connell to give the final con argument. Y'all hear me well enough like that? Cool. Awesome. I mean, it's a miracle I've thrown up, guys. Same. Who here loves to be discriminated against? Exactly. No one. In an AI overlord world, essentially what we are doing is we are submitting or er, cementing our current justice system into our rule of law. We are allowing marginalization and discrimination to be something that is concrete within our justice system. The top half is focusing on this idea that efficiency is something essential and that we should sacrifice these marginalizations for the benefit of a large portion of individuals. But what I'm here to tell you is that if we have this mentality, we are digressing as a society. We need to keep progressing and keep changing our world and our injustices in order to make a more beneficial and a more accepting future. This is exactly what AI is not going to do for us. AI is going to focus on the fact of efficiency, of how to make things more beneficial and how to do them quicker. It's not gonna look at the fact that people have different like ailments or emotions, that people are not just a cookie cutter image. We can see this with AI testing in a study by John Hopkins University. In this study, it was shown that women tend to be marginalized or um, voted less for things like promotions or seen their resumes are viewed with like a lower um, sense of, I guess, like impressiveness as opposed to identical um, resumes from their male counterparts. Tyler and Nate are trying to paint this picture that people suck. But people only suck if we don't realize that we are constantly progressing as a society. Think of what women's standards were in the 1920s. Almost a hundred, more than a hundred years later, women have increased rights. Women are seen more as equals, but that's not enough. We still have discrimination and marginalization in our current system. And we can't embrace AI because we're gonna be cementing our current system. Whereas if we wait a longer, vast period of time and we fight back against this AI, we struggle, we ask the hard questions, we challenge these injustices, we are promoting a system that in the future will be more just in a world that will be more equitable for individuals. Before I continue, I will take the POI. Both sides have agreed that AI comes no matter what. The difference is that on one side it's international cooperation that brings it in which we are all coding this AI together. The other side it's bad actors who are working to create AI as a weapon. Don't you think the bad actors version would be more sexist, would be more discriminatory, and be more harmful? So what the pro is trying to tell you is that our society is currently super equitable, that people don't have things like implicit biases, but that's not true. Programmers have biases that they might not realize are ingrained in the system. And additionally, under the black box principle of having AI obtain any input without individuals knowing what these inputs are and simply spitting out an output is something that is highly negative. Take, for example, like a study from Harvard. It might be an old study where it talks about how women tend to be in jobs that are more like effeminate or considered traditionally domesticated. Under this current system of embracing AI, AI might take this information and draw the conclusion that poor Sally over here, like Ella was talking about, should not be a woodworker because she doesn't fit the mold society wants for her. AI does not know this information is outdated. Therefore, it produces this form of an echo chamber where it believes that these injustices that it's reading are the truth. If we allow a system to accept injustices and not be able to determine when something is false or when something is outdated, then we are cementing injustices in our system. As a general population, it is our duty to make sure that we are constantly improving because we cannot live in a society like our current system where we have groups that are marginalized against, where we have discrimination, where we have sexism, where we have racism. We need a society that is constantly progressing, which is something that AI, it, that, that is something that embracing our AI overlords would be prohibiting. 
So I'm here standing with my partner by saying that an AI future is a man's future. It's a future where women are still put farther down in the systems of jobs. It's a future where discrimination is still an issue that is faced across the globe. But if we fight against AI, in this struggle, we will bring forth beauty. We will bring forth change that is necessary to continue to grow as a society. Thank you. That concludes the speaker's portion of the evening debate. We do have then another round of questions. We are about to ask you to, assuming the QR code will display on the screen, if we're very fortunate, um, we'll ask you to, to take a shot at that QR when it comes up. That will lead you to a voting poll. But while we are doing that and doing that voting, We'd like another round of questions from you all based on the, set, on the bottom half and what might have come up for that. So same system, if you have questions for any of our bottom half speakers, head on over, uh, get in line, and we will get the mic passed around. possible your question was, but you shouldn't. debate. We will not like you. <laughs> uh, we like humans too. We think that there's, it's going to be awesome. Uh, but if it doesn't, you know, why struggle against the end? Okay, um, struggle brings meaning to my life because the good things are better. Uh, what happens when there is no longer struggle? What do I strive for? You strive to create your own struggle and you can strive to create your own meaning. That's probably the most meaningful struggle to myself. I don't think that we get rid of struggle on our side. I think we just get rid of the important struggles. We make it so that the struggles that we live with are struggles that we can actually get through instead of struggles that lead us, lead us starving in a ditch. We create a world where we have less problems and we create a world where we are going to be better off than a world where AI develops on its own and develops without the constraints we can put up on it. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have interpersonal struggles. It doesn't mean we don't have real struggles. It just means that maybe those struggles aren't there because a monopoly decided to make our decisions about how we live our lives. Thank you for that question. Um, once again, the pro is neglecting to understand the fact that if we eliminate any magnitude of struggle, all struggles develop character. It's essential to have a society where we develop character because we are progressing. We're realizing that when things are wrong, we're able to have a brighter mindset and we're able to become more human through our struggles. I, I got something to add. <laughs> uh, assuming you guys have seen the movie Wally. Okay, okay. What I haven't seen in this debate is um, perhaps that we may ultimately be the ones taking advantage of this AI system and then resulting consequences of us taking over that system, if that makes sense. So if you've seen it while we, uh, I don't know if I really want my hamburgers put in a blender and then taken through a straw or uh, floating around on a chair. Um, just like I think the principle on our side is that if the world is changing in a way that we cannot control, there is nothing healthy about struggling ineffectively from your couch. It is not going to be mentally healthy or physically healthy. So while, yeah, humans could take advantage of it, it could make a worse world, it could make an infinitely better world, or it could be insanely middling. 
regardless, the people in this room, unless some of you are absolutely brilliant and loaded and going to affect the world's future AI overlord, we are going to have to, yeah, he pointed. Okay, uh, so everybody but that person uh, <laughs> will simply have to accept our position and find a way to healthily live outside of that. I have a question for the pro side. So society is built on people, and you're claiming that people can have more leisure time through AI, but it's also going to be more optimized and efficient. How are those ideas not contrasting? I'd say those ideas are contrasting because the optimization and efficiency would come from AI recognizing that people are not machines, and that machines can do jobs that are optimizable significantly better. People do people jobs like art, people create and make new innovative ideas, while AI is simply not as effective at those. It put people in people spots and machines in machine spots. One quick thing to add on to there. Let's say that you don't buy the future where AI is doing all of our jobs. I mean, then we can solve some simple problems, such as like a third of the world's food goes to waste because of, because of logistics problems. Think of, imagine a world with that much more food. That is an inherently better world. Seeing no further questions, uh, did everybody who wanted to vote get a chance to vote? Is the system working okay? We, we see results roll again, so. We, we did see results go again. So, we are looking at 80% of votes in favor of Khan. We should not embrace our AI overlords. 20% of votes in favor of embrace. I believe we owe our debaters a round of applause. interested in debate, interested in debate club, interested in more donuts and popcorn, uh, please feel free. And if anybody is running the house lights, it's cool to bring those up now. Um, and yeah, thank you for being here and for all of us having a good time this evening.